Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. In order to understand what happened in downtown Toronto in the early hours of Tuesday morning, you need to go back to the 2011 election. That is four federal elections ago when Stephen Harper still led the Conservatives and Justin Trudeau was a junior member of parliament from Papineau. That was the last time the Conservatives won a seat anywhere in Toronto. And in every election since, the city has been the fortress that has protected the party from whatever gains Conservatives have made elsewhere. Which brings us back to early Tuesday morning in a riding in the very heart of that fortress. A liberal stronghold appears to have just turned blue. Conservative candidate Don Stewart coming out on top in the Toronto St. Paul's by-election. Preliminary results from Elections Canada show the financial and marketing specialists claim just over 15,500 votes, or 42.1 percent. The seat has been a liberal stronghold for the last 10 elections. That's more than 30 years since anyone but a Liberal won that seat. And, well, yes, it's only one seat. It also clearly isn't. If this seat isn't winnable for the Liberals, perhaps nothing is. So the entire country watches to see what happens now. A resignation? A snap election? Nobody's sure yet. But it's clear that whatever Justin Trudeau's party thought they could count on from Toronto, they absolutely cannot. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Stephanie Taylor covers Parliament Hill for the Canadian press, where uh, I imagine things are pretty interesting today. Hi, Steph. Hi, great to be here. I checked because I was curious, and there have been about 15 by-elections since we launched this podcast uh, six years ago. Obviously, we have never done an episode on a single by-election before today. So why did this by-election get so much more coverage as opposed to a, a typical one? I'll say the same thing. I don't know if in my career as being a political reporter, I've ever paid this much attention to a by-election, to be honest. But this by-election was really seen as a referendum on Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the Liberals. The reason for that is that this was a safe seat for them. This has been a seat that if you live in Toronto, St. Paul's, uh, and you're an adult, you have never seen it uh, be any other color than red. They've had it for for 30-odd years. This is a seat that even when Stephen Harper won the majority with the Conservatives back in 2011, this was one of the handful of seats that the Liberals were able to maintain, albeit by a smaller margin. So the fact that there was even a question hanging over what was largely viewed as by every single person in politics as a safe Liberal seat Mm -hmm. is the reason we had so much attention paid to it. And it wasn't just those on the outside of those who cover politics. But those on the inside of politics were, I think, just as surprised in many ways that there was even a a competition to be had here. Maybe for people who aren't familiar with it or not familiar with the city, can you just describe Toronto St. Paul's as a riding? Like, what's it like? Where is it? What are the demographics? That kind of thing. Okay, so this is a, you know, a a downtown Toronto riding. It's next to Davenport, Eglinton Lawrence, University Rosedale. So this is like, you know, liberal territory. Uh, In terms of the demographics, there's, um, you know, there's kind of an interesting mix in this riding. There's a lot of renters. There's also people who are quite affluent who call this riding home. I think as well, one of the things that was a factor in the outcome of this uh, by-election, and we're still kind of doing post-mortem and analyzing, you know, what exactly led to the results was that this riding has a very high number of Jewish residents. Mm -hmm. In terms of ridings in Canada, it has the fifth largest makeup of of Jewish voters. Hmm. And so these factors really up the ante for the outcome of this race because 
we see that this country is still in the grips of an affordability crisis. And in a riding where a, a lot of people are paying rents in a city like Toronto, which has struggled for years, but especially post-pandemic, with the rising costs of rents, that mm-hmm. is hitting people, uh, you know, kind of across the economic spectrum quite hard, which is something that the the government has had to deal with and has been trying to deal with. At the other end of it, given that there is, uh, you know, also affluence and there is some wealth in this riding, this by-election came right after things like the capital gains increase in the latest budget. And the fact that we also in this riding have, a, you know, a, a sizable Jewish population and Toronto has been ground zero for a lot of the protests over the government's response to the Israel-Hamas war and, right. and the ongoing conflict. If you are uh, a Jewish person or you're somebody for whom the people you love and in your life are dealing with a rise in anti-Semitism and anxieties and fears about an increase in violence and an increase in in hateful rhetoric, Mm -hmm. this was also something that was top of mind. So this riding, the confluence of factors kind of made this one to watch in terms of how voters and Canadians were going to react and what kind of message they wanted to send. As well, the prime minister has been around for almost 10 years and how Mm -hmm. people are feeling about him and his performance and the promises he's made and the promises he's not lived up to really also were what people were wanting to send a message about, it turns out. When you talk about it being a safe liberal seat, it's been 30 or more years uh, since it wasn't a liberal seat. Um, What does that mean in the larger context of Toronto for this liberal government? How important have seats like this one been to them staying in power? There's a term called Fortress Toronto, meaning that, you know, since the prime minister has been in power, he hasn't lost a seat in Toronto. And so the city itself and these 416 seats have really been kind of the the bread and butter in many ways of kind of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's brand Mm. and his ability to, you know, bring the Liberals back to being a majority power in 2015. And they've, throughout successive elections, stayed that way. This is a seat that Carolyn Bennett vacated. And that's how this by-election even came to be. Carolyn Mm -hmm. Bennett, a longtime Liberal cabinet minister, won this, uh, you know, initially back in the 90s. So 416 has been, um, and Fortress Toronto has really been kind of the the ground zero for what it means to be in some ways a, a federal liberal under the current leadership. You mentioned that uh, Bennett resigned as an MP to open this seat up. Um, who are the two candidates that fought over this seat? Uh, Leslie Church and Don Stewart. Uh, obviously not the only candidates, but uh, the two that, you know, it was clearly a battle between. So Leslie Church is a name that lots of people around Ottawa and in liberal circles know. She's a longtime political staffer. She was most recently the chief of staff for Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Christia Freeland. So this was really about kind of her transition, or supposed to be in some ways, about her transition from kind of this, this staffer into becoming a member of parliament. On the other side, you had Don Stewart. He ran for the Conservatives. Uh, you know, he had worked and was involved in, you know, the firm that is owned by Jenny Byrne. She's a longtime conservative operative and a you have senior advisor to conservative leader Pierre Polyev. So it was really between these two candidates that were battling it out. And I think for someone like Miss Church, she also represented a lot of, of what the liberal brand is, what the governing liberals are doing. I mean, she had her hands over over the policy and and over the different promises and over executing and trying to kind of meet people where they're at right now. And, you know, Mr. Stewart, he was what the Tories were advertising is, is if you were somebody living in this riding, he is the one who was going to be bringing you change. Um, now, Mr. Stewart, he didn't do uh, really any interviews kind of mm. leading up until this by-election. Miss Church certainly did. And, and even going into election night, Miss Church was saying that the prime minister's name and voters' feelings around him and their fatigue and their disappointment, that is something that she was hearing at the doors. But as she tried to compete for this, and as she did compete for it, she tried to bring this back to being a local election. 
She tried to say that this is not about the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. This is not about Conservative leader, Pierre Polyam. This is about Leslie Church. This is about a local candidate. This is about local issues. But I think the overall narrative and the overall feelings about the government really is what took this local race into one that that the country began to watch. You mentioned a little earlier that it wasn't just uh, people in the media or voters that were looking at this, but people in Ottawa were really looking at it as well. How hard fought was this campaign? Did we see um, heavyweights from from both sides uh, in the riding campaigning? Were Trudeau and Polyev there? The Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, he did come to this riding. And I think for me, it was once I started to see just the string of cabinet ministers that were going weekend after weekend to door knocking that really started to send the signal of the Liberals feel like they need to campaign. And the idea that the Liberals felt like they needed to campaign in what was otherwise uh, a safe seat for a candidate who was very experienced in politics herself and, and, you know, well-known in in Liberal circles was what started to send the indication of, okay, the Liberals are seeing something here. This is a close race. So the Hmm. Prime Minister was there as I said, Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland was there. Francois-Philippe Champagne was there. The industry minister. I, I could go on about just how many, uh, you know, liberal cabinet ministers there. On the, on the conservative side, we did not see conservative leader Pierre Polyev campaign in this riding once the campaign fully began. He, he did stop there in early May. Now, for the several by-elections that have happened since he became leader, it's not often uh, that we necessarily see him go and and campaign into ridings. I mean, this is the first time the Conservatives actually managed to successfully flip a seat, which they didn't already hold. Mm -hmm. But in terms of other Conservatives, we saw Melissa Lansman. She is a GTA Conservative. We saw other Ontario Conservatives go door knock. We saw Ben Mulrooney, the son uh, of former Prime Minister Brian Mulrooney. He was out there kind of bringing a little bit of that star power to the Conservatives. It was a campaign that I, I don't think until... This one, we've really seen uh, these kind of efforts from both sides of the party, but really especially on the Liberals. And yet still, uh, obviously in the early, early morning hours of Tuesday, uh, it was called for the Conservatives and Mr. Stewart. When you look at the results in detail, what sticks out to you about the numbers? How did they win? When Conservatives win in these urban ridings and they win in tight races, one thing Conservatives are very used to is that they would see a vote split. They would see a vote split between the Liberals. They see a vote split with the NDP. And then they're able to kind of come up the middle. What's unique about this situation at this point is that the Conservatives gained by eating not only into the Liberal vote, but also into the NDP vote. So in the 2021 campaign, the last time Canadians went to the polls, the Liberals won this by about 20 or so points. The Conservatives gained, by my estimation, as I speak to you, by about close to 15 to 17 points. So they did a big jump. This is significant and even surprising for conservatives because, as I said, conservatives are not really used to necessarily winning in these kind of tighter urban races. They're used to kind of being able to come up the middle between these two parties. So as much as we're also talking about what this means for the liberals and the prime minister, if your NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh, and and people around him, this is also trouble for you because it, it, it is the conservatives that are eating into that vote and that vote which is collapsing on you or apparently collapsing on you if, 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 if results like this are going to hold or be an indication of what might happen in a general, which is, is new territory for really kind of all the parties. How is everybody in Ottawa reacting to this? Obviously, it was uh, a bit of a surprise, a major surprise. What are you hearing from folks um, inside politics this morning? Conservatives are very surprised. Wow, shocked. Uh, I talked to one conservative who said, you know, they had been door knocking, they were getting good results, or they were hearing good things out the door, but they were not expecting to win. Right. Downtown Toronto is not where the federal conservatives typically do well, nor do they expect to typically do well. So conservatives themselves are pleasantly surprised, very happy by the fact that they were able to get a win, but this was a surprise to them. Now from the Liberals, it's very quiet. We are really not hearing a ton. As I speak to you, we are expecting to hear Freeland to come uh, and and address a separate issue at a news conference this morning. We're expecting the Prime Minister, who's on the West Coast for a separate announcement. It's unclear what is really going to be said from there. But at this point in time, 
Uh, a lot of liberals are not saying a, a whole heck of a lot because going into this, while they knew this was a, a tight race, they were still expecting to be able to win. Now, the party this morning said, you know, they thank Leslie Church and, and Miss Church herself thanked all the, all the volunteers and she herself said that she was disappointed. But the party is saying that they knew it would be a tough race. What they're saying at this point is that with by-elections, by-elections often don't favor uh, the governing party. Although this is a really, this is the first time that this has happened for the governing liberals to be sent a kind of message like this. Right. So um, I think until we hear from Mr. Trudeau, it's going to be kind of all eyes on him and all eyes on him, not just for people in the press gallery and, and political observers, but I think that there are a lot of liberals, cabinet ministers, caucus, volunteers, organizers who are very keen to hear what he has to say in terms of what do they do now? That was going to be my next question is a lot of the reporting on this by-election and why people were focused on it is because it was seen as a referendum on Mr. Trudeau. Um, will this bring new calls for him to step down? And uh, and I guess do the Conservatives even want that at this point or would they prefer to run against the guy that everybody seems to dislike at the moment? The pressure, I think, is going to mount on him. Now, whether that pressure is necessarily going to be coming from inside his own caucus and inside cabinet at this point, there's going to be soul searching. And um, I don't know if people necessarily know what to do yet. I think there is a real debate to be had about while getting rid of him may start to turn the ship a little bit, Things like housing, things like the cost of living, things like unhappiness and displeasure to the Israel-Hamas war, the suite of issues isn't necessarily changing if you're going to get a new leader in there. There was just new polling out from the Angus Reid Institute that suggests that even if the prime minister is no longer going to be the, the leader leading the liberals into the next election, that that's not necessarily going to warm voters to, to come to whoever that successor might be. Also in terms of timeline, if you're in cabinet or caucus or, or liberal supporter writ large, time is ticking. The next election is supposed to happen no later than October 2025, and it's, it's almost July. Yeah. So in less than a year, if you were a liberal, what do you want to see happen? Do you hope that the prime minister stays and tries to right the ship or tries to bring renewal to the party somehow? Or do you roll the dice and say uh, an alternative, be that what it may, might be better than the defeat we, we, we might be heading towards. I was speaking to one polling al analyst who said that if these results hold, the liberals wouldn't just be going towards a defeat, but they would be going potentially to a historic defeat. The conservatives mm. typically, when they write their election strategies, they're not inking in winning in the 416. Right. But if that's the kind of uh, cards that are being dealt, that really speaks to quite the majority that is potentially kind of sitting in people's minds. Now, a lot can change as politics. As one liberal said this morning, a year is a long time in politics. As for the conservatives, we saw conservative leader Pierre Polyev. He posted this morning that this was a, you know, surprising, unexpected victory. He said something to the effect of, you know, Trudeau cannot continue like this and to go for a snap election. So conservatives right now are waiting to see kind of what the liberals and what the prime minister chooses to do now. He has a couple options before him, but I think absolutely they want to run against him. They absolutely want to go up against a leader who is dealing with this suite of issues and dealing with a very low popularity rate at this point in time. And I think for the conservatives as well, while they also say, you know, bringing a new leader in might not be able to reverse the, the liberal fortunes, there is always that risk that if a party does a leadership race, leadership races are a chance for a renewal. There you sell memberships, you fundraise, you try to bring new people in. Mm -hmm. So there is an absolute risk there. And we've already seen Mr. Polyev come out and he's trying to paint Mark Carney, the former Bank of Canada governor, as quote unquote carbon tax Carney. I don't think it's, it's uh, you know, a coincidence that he's already trying to kind of frame someone who might potentially at some point in the future throw his hat into the liberal leadership ring. We have no idea if that's what Mr. Carney plans on doing. But the Conservatives are certainly mindful of not just what the prime minister's fate might be, but who might be waiting in the wings and how that party might respond 
So really all eyes are on the prime minister at this point, uh, including from the conservatives. Stephanie, thank you so much for breaking this all down for us. And uh, you were probably expecting a relaxing trip into summer, but uh, here you are. And I guess we see what happens next. Absolutely. It might be a summer of soul searching. Stephanie Taylor, Parliament Hill reporter with the Canadian Press. That was The Big Story. For more from us, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can also send us feedback on this topic or any other, or suggest a topic that we should cover by emailing us. Hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca is how to do that. Or you can call and leave a voicemail at 416-935-5935. The Big Story is available in all of the podcast players in the world. If yours asks you if you want to rate or review or leave a message, please do that. You can also get it on a smart speaker by asking that smart speaker to play The Big Story podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.